Rohan Shankar. I'm a senior lead machine learning engineer at, at DraftKings. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about simulating the Super Bowl, how we use real-time machine learning to predict the NFL. So yeah, firstly, a little bit about DraftKings and who we are. Um, we're a digital sports entertainment company with multiple verticals, including a sports book. Within DraftKings, uh, I'm in a team called Sports Intelligence, and we're responsible for producing sports betting content, primarily for the sports book. So what does this mean in practice? We generate the odds. If you go on our product and look on site, load up our, our sports book, click into events, by and large, most of the markets, the prices you see, um, are produced by our team. So when building production machine learning systems, there's a wide variety of challenges to address. Um, and I guess the entire field of machine learning operations is there to um, describe those challenges and provide solutions for those challenges. Um, I'm not gonna focus on everything, but I, I wanted to talk, call out a couple of points that are particularly relevant for DraftKings. Um, so the first bucket of uh, considerations is around accuracy and pricing performance. Um, obviously a concern for every production system. Um, for our specific use case, we have to have a model that generates 300 betting markets, and they have to be accurate. When we say accurate here, we're mainly talking about financial metrics, like how much money are these markets making? The interesting thing about the sports betting domain is customers have an opportunity to make money directly on your predictions. So if your model is very bad, if your model is wrong, you can lose a lot of money very fast. Um, another consideration is that incoming data to our model has to be timely. Um, when events are happening in a real life game, we want them to be processed as quickly as possible because we need to make sure that the prices we're offering aren't stale, they're up to date. Um, features that are a little bit slower moving, such as player and team ratings that maybe aren't gonna change you know, within the game every single play, still have to be up to date, up to you know, the last completed game. Another branch of considerations is about building production grade services. Um, so this, this class of considerations is about reliability, stability. Um, for DraftKings, we're really concerned with our model having a high uptime. If the model's down for a period of time when uh, a sporting event is on, customers have a horrible experience, they can't use the product, um, that they'll yeah, easily be turned away from our offering. And in terms of like, the exact load and, and latency that we, we're interested in here, um, our model has to handle around 1,200 requests, and each request has to have a P95 latency of about two seconds. So this is a real-time machine learning system. Two seconds is a fairly generous time budget. It's not a super low latency, um, but you still have to do quite a lot in that um, time. So yeah, um, our architecture, like what have we built to accomplish this? Our, at the minute, our architecture is roughly split into two halves. On the left-hand side, you can see Databricks, our machine learning platform. And on the right-hand side is our Kubernetes environment. Um, so that, let's just start on the left-hand side. In Databricks, we're performing a wide variety of common data science tasks, like feature engineering and model training. All data and modeling assets are stored in Unity Catalog, uh, and we're leveraging yeah, Unity Catalog for um, governance and control. Um, on the right-hand side, in our Kubernetes environment, we have an architecture that's generally microservices that are communicating either via um, Kafka or by HTTP. So in particular, I'm gonna call out a software component, an in-house software component called the request generator. This component is responsible for aggregating various incoming data so sources and triggering requests to our model. Um, we also have the model, which we're gonna call our simulation engine. Not gonna talk about that too much right now, but we'll dive into it a lot more in the later slides. The simulation engine will build the markets we talked about and provide those uh, markets to the customers. Um, and yeah, when we have this sort of like to like almost a split in our architecture, I think there's a couple of natural questions to address. The first is like why, and the second is how they interact. Um, so for us, we have used Kubernetes in production for many, many years. We've got a great SRE team. We've got an extremely battle-hardened, battle-tested, reliable production infrastructure. Um, and when we, you know, when we moved to Databricks, we've been a Databricks customer for about 18 months. We didn't want to lose all the um, extreme like stability guarantees we knew we had in that environment. But we had a lot of problems with um, data scientist workflow and the software development lifecycle. So we wanted to unlock like Databricks and allow data scientists to accelerate with all the cool MLflow features, the feature engineering pipelines, the model training. Um, so that's why, um, and I think like these boundaries will blur over time as we get a little bit more familiar with Databricks and uh, you know ex experiment with other parts of the product. Um, and in terms of interaction models, so we've got a component called the Feature Store Publisher you can see on the left-hand side. 
This is a component that's taking our feature store data from Unity Catalog and publishing it to Kafka. Um, so to make it available to the rest of our microservices. And then the line from the simulation engine to Unity Catalog in the bottom right, this is what we call model injection. Uh, at runtime, we will download models from the model registry to ensure in the, um, our simulation engine has the most up-to-date machine learning models at all points in time. Cool, so that was a little bit about the theory. Um, hopefully you stayed with me. We'll try and go through with a bit more of a fun example uh, and keep it, keep it um, yeah, a, a bit more fun. So yeah, I'm sure people who watch Super Bowl 58 remember Christian McCaffrey's 21-yard touchdown in the second quarter to give the 49ers a 10-0 lead. Any 49ers fans, we can just pretend the game finished there. I'm not gonna talk about the final score. Um, so what happens between that event happening in the real game and our production systems? Well, the third party um, feed providers, which you might have seen on the last slide, will provide this data in a variety of formats. Here we're just looking at a JSON snippet of the same play. So you can see we've got you know, a description field, a little bit of metadata about the play. This is just a subset of the fields. The actual JSON payload is significantly larger. Um, but this acts as a trigger that you know something's happened, we need to do something. So first we'll talk about the feature building. Um, so when that event hits our data lake uh, and our feature building pipelines run, um, we will start to build up our um, detailed view of that play. So we, we use a medallion architecture. You can see, just about see the bronze, silver, and gold steps in this workflow. And what we're doing at this point is enhancing the play with extra metadata and information that um, yeah, basically gives us a really granular detailed view of that single play. Um, so the row you can see is the same uh, McCaffrey play. You can see, you know, for instance, the air yards was negative five, but 26 yards after the catch got us to the 21 total yards to the play. Um, now, just having that detailed view of the play isn't quite enough. We, we also layer in a lot of other aggregated features like player and team ratings. Now, for, unfortunately in this talk, I don't have time to talk through our ratings in much detail. However, at 4 p.m., my colleagues will be talking through our rating system in much more detail. So if you've got some time, go check out that talk. It'll be really great. So we have some features. We have our, all, all the data points we care about. Now, what about model training? Um, when you're building machine learning models, one of the first questions you have to answer is like, what's the structure of these models? How am I gonna build them? What are they gonna predict? In our case, we are gonna use individual machine learning models to predict probabilities at various decision points in a game. So an example makes this a little bit clearer. The action classifier, for instance, predicts what action the offense is gonna choose at the start of a play. Are they gonna pass? Are they gonna rush? Are they gonna punt, Etc. The pass completion model says, okay, Let's imagine a play was a pass. What's the probability it's, it's successful? Um, and we'll show a little bit about how those models are combined um, in the next slide. Um, so yeah, I've got a little code example here. We're loading our action model, um, and we're gonna predict um, for the same McCaffrey play um, with our features. Um, I've simplified the classes slightly, so it's just a pass versus rush. But for that play, our model thought 68% of the time it would be a passing play, and 32% of the time it would be a rushing play. Cool, so onto yeah, the simulation, um, Monte Carlo simulation. So Monte Carlo si simulation is a statistical technique for um, estimating a distribution but with repeated random sampling. So in our case, we will simulate a game tens of thousands of times. Within each single game, we're performing the simulation loop that you see on screen. So starting at the top left, we have our features from our game state. You can think of this as like the information about where you are in the game. What's the current score? What's the quarter? What's the time on the clock, et cetera. We will then make our predictions with our machine learning models to determine what happens in the next play. That will give us an updated state that tells us the outcome of the play. And then we'll repeat and we'll loop through calling our models millions of times to generate these predictions. Um, yeah, and we're gonna dive a little bit more into the predict with ML models bit in the next slide. So, this um, flowchart is a yeah, slimmed down version of what we actually do within a single um, instance of that um, simulation loop. So on the left-hand side, we have you know, what happens in the next play, and you, we have the game state features, we know the point of the game, we have the other like, slow, slower moving data at that point. We'll then call our action classifier. That tells us what the offense is gonna do. Are they gonna pass, rush, something else? 
If they rush, for instance, we have a model to predict how many yards is the rushing play going to be for. If it's a pass, we have a model for the yards attempted. How many yards is the pass going to be attempted for? Then we have the pass outcome model to predict if the pass is going to be successful. And while this is just a snippet, you can see how you can build up these individual machine learning models within a simulation to generate more complicated predictions. And we generally have around 20 of these models um, that naturally correspond to various decision points in the game. So yeah, let's keep going with our example. We had our McCaffrey play, which was a 68% pass and 32% rush. We then are doing Monte Carlo simulation. So I'll generate a random number, 0.56. It's very fortunate every time I do this slide, it's the same random number, because otherwise I think I'll be very confused. Um, we map our random number into the, to the cumulative distribution to determine what happens. So in this example, if the random number was between 0 and 0.68, we'd say it was pass. If it was between 0.68 and 1, we'd say it was a rush. Here, it's a pass. We're going to continue the, the next thing for the remaining models. We'll um, get our prediction for the odds attempted model, sample, and continue. So yeah, to bring it all together, um, we have incoming data sources, the real-time game state, the third-party data feeds that tell us what's just happened in the game. We have our features from Databricks, the player and team ratings I mentioned that are made available in Kafka. And then we have some other like, more slower moving static data, like game information, uh, you know, what teams and players are involved, um, things like injury news. Our request generator aggregates this, to data, uh, this data together for us and sends requests to our model. Our model performs the Monte Carlo simulation loop, making all those um, machine learning model predictions. And from the output, we can then aggregate to the betting markets we, we need. So yeah, in terms of results, um, yeah, like I mentioned, DraftKings have had Databricks for the last 18 months, and this, uh, um, this system has been in production over the last NFL season, um, meeting the latency and throughput SLAs that I mentioned on the, on the earlier slide. Um, in terms of financial performance, um, yeah, I probably wouldn't be here if it was terrible. Um, the system was accurate and performant. Um, and in New York, where some of the financial metrics are public, um, this um, system was able to help de um, deliver a 16% hold for the Super Bowl specifically. Awesome. So yeah, um, just to wrap up uh, very quickly, we talked about Monte Carlo simulations for sports predictions. We've seen a little bit about how you can chain individual machine learning models into a more complex system within Monte Carlo simulations. We've seen how DraftKings are using Databricks for the data science um, workflows in SDLC, uh, and a little um, flavor into how DraftKings are, produce, are building production-grade machine learning services. So yeah, I've got a couple of resources on this slide, which I'd, if you're interested in the talk, like I'd highly recommend. Um, there's a blog post which um, dives into a similar football example with lots of code examples too. And the DK engineering medium, we have lots of articles from our data science teams talking about modeling, but also from our architecture teams that talk about our production system and like how that works. Um, so yeah, that's me. Thanks everyone for listening. And yeah, happy to take any questions as well. Yeah.